With the launch of Forsaken, we dove deeper beneath the Awoken secrets hidden to us for years and unearthed some pretty amazing truths. Last time, we discussed how the Awoken were born, everything from their emergence between Light and Dark, the first Queen of the Awoken, and how Mara eventually led an army back to the solar system to save their ancestors. Today, we're going to build upon that story and discuss what happened after the first Awoken arrived in the system. The Awoken were born from light and darkness during the Collapse. As the darkness engulfed the system, the Traveler unleashed a wave of light, transporting humans aboard an Exodus Green ship to a location known as the Distributary, where they would later awaken and form a new civilization. In the Distributary, they named their specific planet the Tributary, a sanctionary planet where life blossomed and there was no aging process. The beings here were immortal. Marasov was the second to awaken, and after years of gaining a following, she wanted to head back to the solar system and save their human ancestors, or at least, what was left of them. Upon arriving home, Mara thought that Earth would have been a deserted planet and that life would be long gone, but she was wrong. It seemed the last of humanity housed themselves under a mysterious alien sphere in what they called the last safe city. This is where our story today begins. So in the first revanche cards, Mara alerts her Awoken to the last safe city and Aldrin encounters an alien force known as the Fallen. Aldrin returned to the reef during a long, unquiet night when the Awoken people huddled in their beds and hammocks, gathered in ice caves and half-lit habitat cylinders, haunted by visions and portents. Faces appeared to them in the sublimating swirl of cometary ice. Images and portraits became impossible to distinguish from their real counterparts. All statues were shrouded, lest they appear to passers-by as corpses. Something had changed in them after the return to the outer cosmos. A live wire hum passed through the tendons in their hands, their jaws popped when they swallowed, and flashes of light like the impact of cosmic rays obscured their vision. It felt to Mara as if they had lowered their feet into an ocean of charge and raised their hand to some invisible cable overhead, as if they were now again in contact with immense and opposing forces that had left an ancient mark. Mara then talks to Keldo Waj for a bit. This apparently is one of her first recruits who joined her on this journey back to the solar system. Now they talk for a bit about magic and the physics of these worlds and then Mara says this. We're in death's domain now. We're all dying again. We were immortal in the distributary, weren't we? Some part of us was attuned to the universe. And now that we are no longer receiving the distributary signal, we're attuned to something new. At that moment, a hatch slammed open and Aldrin stumbled in, grinning ferociously. Aliens, he rasped. I found aliens, and one of them cut my throat. Mara then calls a caucus of elected representatives in the Sacred Fire, one of the largest hogs in the Reef of Derelicts. The fire was built to support habitat construction on Four Vesta, where Mara hopes to one day anchor the entire flotilla and set down roots. But the hopeful, fearful faces before her make Mara afraid it'll never happen. What if everyone runs off at the first hint of home? Having come so far across worlds and eons to see Earth again, how could she ask them to hold back now? We found humanity, she tells them. We found our ancestors. The cheer of triumph and wonder thrills her to the marrow. Most of these Awoken are distributary born, raised on myths of humanity and also the Traveler. She has just opened the pages of their storybooks and conjured them to life. What remains of the human species lives in a single settlement. She nods to Aldrin who snaps his fingers for footage. His ship's holographic perspective plunges through the fluffy strata of clouds and mist out into clear air. A lucid vista, a perfect instant, the white mountains, the city, and the enormous shattered sphere that hangs above it. Freeze, Aldrin commands. That is the Traveler. As the crowd murmurs and thrills, Mara feels herself brittle. She doesn't like that thread of reverence. She doesn't like the Traveler looming there, almost but not quite completely dormant, like a dying heart ripped from its body and thrown into warm water. If the Traveler had the power to protect anyone, wouldn't it protect more than one huddled settlement? Suddenly a girl leaps up from the crowd. What are we waiting for, she calls. That's everything we came to find. They need us and that's where we belong. 
Aldrin and Mara trade glances, Aldrin snaps his fingers, and the recording resumes. Something moves in the treetops, the canopy roils and parts. A red-brown aircraft shaped like a fat, wingless, furious, angry dragonfly bursts from cover and climbs to intercept. Aldrin's head cued camera tracks the target and Mara imagines his narrow grin as he waits for the other guy to make a move. The dragonfly ship drops a brace of little needles as they erupt into a dirty orange flame and come arrowing for Aldrin. Everyone in the caucus gets an earful of his grunts as he whips through a high G turn and climbs away. Those are fallen, Aldrin says. They're a species of interstellar scavengers and substance pirates. They've been here for a long time and they've sacked most of the large settlements that survived the original fall of humanity. <laughs> there may be more fallen than there are humans left on Earth. He lifts his chin to bear the pale scar across his throat. I landed and went looking for prisoners. I was ready when he pulled two knives on me, but it turned out he had an extra set of arms. Mar then adds they're all over the system. We detected flotillas of their interstellar ships around Jupiter and Venus. They don't go near Mars, but that's only because it's under occupation by another alien species. Mercury is, well, you can see for yourself. Another voice then says, so they need our help, don't they? We have to go to them, our ships, our technology, we could make the difference. No, Mara then collapses the projected images between her hands. She stayed up late wrestling with this dilemma, which kept her from wrestling with Jur. It was a choice she had to make alone. We can't reveal our existence, lest the fallen track us down. We need more information. Our focus must remain on securing this derelict reef, bootstrapping industry and population, and scouting out the solar system. So after learning of this last safe city and that their ancestors were okay, most of the Awoken wanted to head back to Earth. In fact, more than 80% wanted to begin an expedition right away. At this point, Mara swears and pulls a bloody line of solidified slag from her brother. Unacceptable. We can't lose our skills or their genes. The Awoken have yet to adapt to the attrition of this harsh, space-born world, and tentative mothers are still in the early stages of designing their babies. It's vital to maintain a diverse gene pool, and the Fallen will vector them back to us. Mar then has a conversation with Jir Ido about this whole situation. If some of her Awoken do head back to Earth, the Fallen could find them and they'd be doomed. Jir then goes on about some type of heroic death she would have for her queen, and Mara says it won't happen because she won't allow it to happen. Sometime later, Mara is on the ground gasping for air. A large apocalyptic shutter goes off, and it appears a ship is leaving the reef. Mara has failed. Mara gets super angry and decides she is going to override the command and shut down the ship's systems, but it seems she can't because it's a salvaged human vessel, deaf to her commands. She gasps in frustration and contacts Jur. Let them go, Mara says. If one ships away, there's no sense holding back the rest. Our position is compromised. Broadcast to everyone. I'm going to allow anyone who wants to leave the reef to go. This is their one and only chance. She rolls onto her back and stares up into the swirling vortices of coolant, seeing faces, futures, the lives she has just lost, the lives she might yet lose. She brought her people here to die in the sense that she brought them into mortality, but she never wanted it to happen this quickly. They know, your majesty, Jer says. They already know. What? You told us. We heard your voice. There was all like gratitude in Jer Ido's voice. Mara, I heard you. You spoke to me. So it seems after all this frustration and riot, Mara eventually let those who wanted to to travel back to Earth and go freely. This was their one and only chance. Yes, this could have had big consequences, but one ship's already leaving, and their position was revealed anyway, so there was no point in holding the others back, right? This began a huge change for the Awoken and gave much more diversity to their species. The original Riven Awoken were Riven again into Reefborn and even Earthborn. Those who left went to scour the ruins for lost history and give some succor to their human cousins who still clung to a hostile world. These Awoken who ventured to Earth eventually became one with the last safe city. 
they bred with other Awoken and even normal humans, and eventually forgot about places like the Reef and the Distributary, although there was always in their souls an itch, a vector pointing to a distant place in the asteroid belt where their queen still dwelt. This began a new age of diversity and exploration. One day, the Fallen struck, Mara was proclaimed queen, and it all happened very, very quickly. My Tekiun, she said, gathering Kel the Waj and the others who remained, will be given absolute authority to explore our new power, the Traveler's Relics, and all associated domains. We are no longer in the realm of pure science. We require an order of mysteries and witches to tend to them. Not an hour later, a fallen catch threw off its stealth and began a deceleration burn towards Four Vesta. The four-armed predators had traced one of the Earthward ships back through all of its erratic course changes and to the reef. They came in search of the source of these blue apekin. A salvo of coherent matter guns gutted the catch. Blink quick death for the mighty ship, ancient fury compressing matter into a relativistic pinhead. It was a waste of weapons that couldn't be recharged or reloaded, however, and the Baron in command had already scattered his skiffs like camouflage seats. The fallen raiders came down all over the reef and cut their way inside. The awoken, young to mortality, terrified of death, fled in fear. Mara, Aldrin, and Jir Ido rallied as many as they could. Jir fought in a powered combat shell, but Mara needed to be seen vulnerable. She fought with a pistol and a dagger, and her brother Aldrin moved like a wraith at her flank. Her people were ashamed of their timidity. No more were the fallen, scuttling alien predators. Now they were an indignity, an offense to regal privilege to be met with a snarl and a rifle shot. The Awoken saw their desperation, how the stump-limbed dreg stumbled forward emaciated, how the vandals cringed from battle as they peeled off wall panels desperate for salvage to please their captains. Armored Jir Ido met with the fallen Baron in zero gravity combat above his spider tank and then shot him dead. Ether from his body hissed into vacuum. Jir threw herself off the spider tank and clung to the sacred fire's hall. Laughing in joy, she cut into the tank's barrel and threw a charge inside. The tank then fired, the charge detonated, and Jir Ido was thrown clear, utterly unharmed. That was where I should have died, she said. In wonder and in her mind was the smiling face of her queen. In the Telic cards, Mara hopes this fallen attack would lure the scattered Awoken back to their home in the Reef. She hoped that it would help repair the damage they caused by leaving in the first place. Her plea didn't really work and the Awoken remained throughout the system. Although the fallen did attack, they didn't broadcast the Awoken position back to their Kel. It seemed that the Baron wanted to keep the price for himself, but kind of failed in the process. So at the moment, the Reef remained safe and Mara began building an army. She appointed paladins to oversee her new military, she created corsairs to scour the asteroid belt, and the Reef was the most secure it could ever be. Mara wanted to establish an Awoken culture to have all of her people gather in one place in their own city so their ideals could flourish. Gather in one place, Aldrin warned her, and you can make yourself a target. Mara had considered this and found an answer. Go forth and find me a power unknown to all other powers of this world. Return it to me and I shall make it a cornerstone of my new city, where the Awoken shall dream of all they have been and all that is yet to come. So Aldrin went out voyaging among the world, swift as a blue shift ghost. In time, he returned to the reef with a creature not larger than his hand, saying, Behold, sister, the lie that makes itself true. This is an Ahamkara. It was Mara alone who established a covenant with that young Ahamkara, which chose the youth's name Riven in honor of its host. It was Mara alone whose singular will and unity of purpose saved the Awoken from that which we now name the Anthem Anatheme. It seemed Mara wanted to be the only person who talked to this Ahamkara as she says, this secret is mine alone. So in some of those tabs, Aldrin's like, hey, why can't I speak to it? And Mara's like, yeah, it's mine, you know, thanks for giving it to me, but you can't talk to it. Jir Ido then goes on to this weird discussion about how she thinks Mara is a god. Mara then says that Jir cannot worship her as a god because there would be no more love. To worship is to yield all power and I cannot love what has no power over me. At this, the Amkara coiled around her neck, yawned, and showed its fangs. I see, Jiraido said. 
then to me you are not yet a god. Although in time the knowledge of what Mara would become pushed them apart, it was kind of a happy push as a friend might urge a beloved companion onward to a distant opportunity, and their days together were spent gladly. Anyway Guardians, that's all I got for today's video. This was basically part two out of I believe three, I mean the next part we're going to do is discussing the Taken King situation and uh, what exactly happened from the lore standpoint of that, but for now we're wrapping up part two here and if you haven't seen part one I definitely recommend you checking that out. It basically explains you know, how the Awoken were born, where they came from, and the crazy area they inhabited for a period of time. Let me know down below what other Forsaken mysteries would you like me to dive into in future videos and I thank you so much for watching. Anyway, my name's Evade, and I'll catch you all in the next video.